So this is the last time that we're together uh, in a large room as a large group. And <clears throat> before I introduce uh, this morning's keynote speakers, I just want to take a few moments to, of course, thank you all again for what you do as uh, champions of, of this cause and as uh, members of this foundation. And I want to remind you that we are always here for you in a, uh, at a toll-free number, at uh, various emails, and hopefully in visits around the country that we'll get to see you again. I've made a lot of friends this weekend. I've reacquainted myself with old ones, and it's just great to be with you. <clears throat> I want to leave you with something that, some words that I wish actually I had come up with. Um, they are words that, um, that have meant a lot to me over the course of my life and my career. And my staff can tell you that I have this framed on my desk and I refer to it every day. And it's something that I think um, means a lot to, to me and I hope it will resound a little bit with you because I know that all of us, whether we have a chronic illness or we just are going about our days um, doing the best we can with what we have to do both in our personal and professional lives, the one thing that we can deal with no matter what's handed to us is our attitude. So I want to share um, a saying that came from a gentleman. He is a rather well-known, uh, nationally known um, evangelical minister. And many years ago I had the pleasure of, okay, I'll disclose it, I was in the A cast of Up With People back in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Mostly, I learned how to uh, remove equipment from the stage during thunderstorms, but uh, it was a great experience. But uh, Chuck Swindoll's mega church, which I called the BAP Dome, hosted us and all these families. And one of the things that we were, had to do, or not had to do, but were invited to do was go to church that, Monday, or that Sunday morning. And it happened to be <clears throat> the Sunday that he did a sermon around what has become one of his more famous um, messages, and it is this. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude, to me, is more important than facts. It's more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. It's more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, an organization, a home. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we embrace for that day. <clears throat> we cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing that we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. And so I want to leave you with, as we depart from Atlanta and go back to our daily lives, I hope that you will always keep an attitude of openness, of hope, and inspiration for yourselves and one another because our attitudes are what we have that can most affect change in ourselves and for our communities and for our causes. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. And with that, I would like to take a moment. Thank you. And with that, I want to take a moment to introduce our closing keynote speakers, Linda McNamara, a registered nurse and MBA, and Dr. Karen Kempner, PhD, who are the co-authors of the book, If You Have to Wear an Ugly Dress, Learn to Accessorize, The Guidance, Inspiration, and Hope for Women with Lupus Scleroderma and Other Autoimmune Illnesses. 
Nurse Linda lives a happy and fulfilling life despite having the serious illness, systemic lupus. She's retired from Clemson University in South Carolina, where she spent 12 years as the director of the university's academic nurse-managed health center. She also represents the patient and public perspectives on several national committees. And she has authored articles for numerous peer-reviewed journals and is a frequent speaker at conferences around the country. Joining Linda is Dr. Karen Kempner, a health educator who has worked in public health and health promotion for more than 25 years. She is currently an associate professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences at Clemson University. Karen was diagnosed with systemic sclerosis in 1992 and also serves the foundation as vice president of the Scleroderma Foundation's South Carolina chapter. So please join me in welcoming the authors and healthcare professionals, Linda and Karen, as today's keynote speakers. Thank you all very much. So I'm Karen Kemper, and this is my dear friend and colleague, Linda McNamara. We are so appreciative to be here today. Um, how many of you have been at, uh, this is your first time at the conference? That's fabulous. I remember my first conference. Wasn't Seth right in his opening session? You're going to learn new things, meet new people, and share today. So we still have some time to go today with some wonderful opportunities. But uh, thank you so much. We are so grateful for uh, having the chance to share our story with you. We want to um, thank the Scleroderma Foundation, Robert, Carrie, Christina, and all the staff who invited us to come to speak and share our stories with you and for doing such a great job pulling this together. It's so valuable to us, and I know as a patient, I find it immensely valuable. We also want to thank um, some loved ones, our dear Susan Melvin, the president of our South Carolina chapter, who has helped us so much, and Will McNamara, Linda's husband, who is always there championing for us and, and being our support <coughs> and carrying a lot of heavy things for us. We appreciate that. So you might be wondering, what in the world does an ugly dress have to do with us? Um, well, I'm reminded of a story uh, several years ago when Linda and I first uh, registered our domain name with a, a web browser server, whatever they're called. And uh, one of the representatives from GoDaddy contacted us the next day to follow up on the establishment of the new account. And he said, I've just got to ask you, what in the world is the ugly dress? And I explained to him that the ugly dress is a metaphor for our disease. It's a metaphor for any negative thing that happens to you, this thing that you have to wear. And he listened to the story and said, you know, I, I think I'm living with an ugly dress too, or maybe an ugly suit because I'm living with cancer. I get it. So while the concept of the ugly dress might come or might relate more quickly to women, men get the message as well. And even my 77-year-old father, who has battled a lifetime with chronic depression, tells me, you know what, Karen? I have an ugly dress too. So all of us in this room are living with an ugly dress to some extent, something that we would rather not have to wear, something we'd rather not have in our life. And each of us has to make choices about how we're going to act, think, our attitudes, our behaviors, what Linda and I call our accessories. These are the accessories. It's mental. It's very mental and in your habits and your, and your routines. So today I'm going to, oops, let me get my little remote control. I'm going to, forgive me for my technological. I want to share with you a little bit about our story. Um, we're going to sh talk a little bit about our ugly dresses. We're going to share with you a little bit about how we met, how Linda and I met, this idea of an accessorizing process, and we're going to share five strategies with you um, that we have found particularly useful. First, let me give you a little background about myself. I was diagnosed with scleroderma when I was 31 years old, shortly after I started to work at Clemson University. I knew something was wrong with me for a little while. I just didn't know what. I had uh, swollen hands, some ulcers on my fingers, itchy skin. But I was a grad student. I didn't have health insurance. And I wasn't scared enough to go to a doctor, but I was kind of scared to go to a doctor because I didn't want it to be a pre-existing condition. So when I started working and I had health insurance, I finally went to the doctor. <coughs> I'll call this person doctor number one. So doctor number one takes a look at my hands. He says, 
Um, we're probably never going to know why your hands are swollen. So come back in about six weeks. And anyway, it's just a vanity problem. So that was my first experience with the ugly dress. Anger, shame, confusion at being treated that way. So exit doctor number one, enter doctor number two, about a week later. Uh, the ulcer on my finger was so painful that I sought out a second doctor. I knew I wasn't going back to the first one. And this doctor was a lot more concerned about what he saw. And he said, Karen, we're going to try to save your finger. And I was shocked. In a week, we go from I have a vanity problem to you're gonna, you want to amputate my finger. And that was my second experience with the ugly dress. Fear. What in the world is happening? What's going on? Well, long story short, my second physician was wonderful. And I owe a lot to him. He didn't actually diagnose me. Uh, but he was there with me in those early days and helped me uh, by being patient with me. He did not discount me. He gave me time and he helped me learn that I was going to have to work with a team of healthcare providers the rest of my life. So he was wonderful. So that was a great case of not so great doctor and a great doctor. Now, about two years later, Linda and I met. Uh, she started to work at Clemson University um, where I was an assistant professor and she was the uh, director of the nurse managed care center that Robert mentioned. And I still remember um, when we first met during her interviews, we clicked immediately. I mean, we, we, we were yakking away even then, taking up way too much time talking. And uh, we've stayed friends like that ever since, so it was really a blessing. Unfortunately, soon after she started to work at Clemson, Linda also started to develop an autoimmune disease, lupus. Makes you wonder a little bit about Clemson, huh? <laughs> We have a lot of people with autoimmune diseases at, in my college. Well, as, uh, as Linda went through those initial phases, that initial year, which I think is one of the hardest years when you are diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, there's so much uncertainty. Uh, we talked a lot and we shared a lot of our, our stories. And she asked me uh, how I was able to keep a positive attitude uh, living with scleroderma. How was I able to keep such a positive attitude? Well, I told her about a poem I had written early on after my diagnosis in which I called scleroderma was my ugly dress. And it was this ugly dress I had to wear. Sometimes I had to wear it, and sometimes I didn't. I did not like the way I felt in it. I didn't like the way it made me feel, and I wanted it off. I just wanted it off. But I wasn't going to get it off. So I had to learn to deal with it. Well, Linda thought about this story of mine a little bit, and she said, well, you know what, Karen? When I have to wear an ugly dress, I accessorize. <laughs> so then we both said, hey, that'd make a great title for a book. <laughs> Unfortunately, at the time, we were busy, and uh, we didn't really know how to write a book, but we were naive enough and we were arrogant enough to think that as healthcare professionals and academicians, we ought to be able to write a book about living with chronic illness. So we did our due diligence. We went to the library and we researched publishing agents. And we got a list of about 60 or 70 agents. And we wrote letters to each of them asking if they'd be interested in this book that we hadn't yet written. <laughs> and then we waited, and we waited, and we waited. And then the letters started coming. Rejection letter number one. Thank you very much, but. And then number two and number three, and number four. <laughs> Finally, my husband will tell you, and Karen as well, I'm an impatient person. I quit counting, and I scan the contents of these 50 or 60 remaining rejection letters, and I file them away. So then I told Karen, Whew, we don't have to write that book. Nobody wants it. We don't have to write it. So 
we were relieved and we went about living our lives, managing our career, managing our personal lives, and managing our illnesses. And over the years, from time to time, people would ask us to come and speak and to share our experiences. Always, Karen's the younger one, so she would always say, we really ought to write that book. So, it only took us 16 years of living with our illness, <laughs> 16 years of talking about writing a book, six months to write it, a year and a half to rewrite it, but I am proud to say <laughs> that we finally finished our book in August of 2011. Timing is everything. If we had written the book at the beginning, it would have been a different book. We had not yet learned that living with a chronic illness on a daily basis will rip away all arrogance and naivete. Living with a chronic illness on a daily basis brings you face to face with all your fears and your vulnerabilities. Karen is going to share with you some of the ways that we had to learn to deal with these fears and all of these daily challenges of living with chronic illness. I'll go ahead and put it up for you. So as Linda said, we needed to live with the disease for a while to learn how to live with the disease. So it took us a little time. And um, the blessing of time is that you, you do learn a few things. I've lived with scleroderma for about 20 years, and I've managed some things well, and I've not done so well with some things. It's a constant learning process. Over time, I've had friends comment that they thought I've had a positive attitude. That's what they see. They see that positive attitude. And I've told them, you know, I'm not going to have scleroderma and a bad attitude, too. I can't do anything about having scleroderma, but I can do something about my attitude. And that doesn't mean I never have a bad attitude and I never feel negative, but I'm choosing to nurture a positive attitude. I'm saying this is what I want to strive for. This is what I value. Linda and I were very lucky to be able to spend a lot of time talking together. You should find somebody to talk with find somebody who you can relate with. And we talked about our experiences in our lives and, and dealing with chronic illness and things that didn't have anything to do with chronic illness. But we decided early on with our illnesses that we didn't want the diseases to define our lives. We were realistic. It's going to influence our lives. It's going to constrain our lives. It's going to change our options. But it doesn't have to define us. I am not scleroderma. And Linda is not lupus. I am more than that. She is more than that. So we decided to really very carefully and conscientiously choose our behaviors, our attitudes, and our approaches to dealing with this illness, these illnesses that we would have to deal with the rest of our lives. And over the many, many years, we have learned how to face very different challenges. So each of us has different things we've had to experience, but we've learned from each other. We found it particularly important to focus on and clarify what's important to us and identify our values and priorities and work to make these positive responses our default option. So you can get into a habit, and a habit that makes things worse or a habit that can make things a little better and maybe even a habit that makes life more beautiful. Our accessorizing process was actually inspired by Dr. Viktor Frankl who was a, pris a prisoner in a concentration camp during World War II. And you might be familiar with some of his uh, inspiring writings. Um, Man's Search for Meaning was his book. And his key message was, find meaning in your life and make the most of opportunities that are present. So regardless of whether we have an illness or not, we can have meaning in our life and we can, have, we can make a significant contribution. 
After getting out of the concentration camp, Dr. Vickle, uh, Frankel, I always want to say Vicar Frankel, Dr. Frankel wrote, everything can be taken away from a man but one thing, a last of human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's attitude. Between that time that something happens to you and your reaction to it, either in how you think about it or how, or how you act, there is a space, a moment, and in that moment is a f your freedom to choose how you're gonna respond. Choose on what you'll focus your attention and choose your actions. Our accessorizing process is kind of like this referee in the picture. It keeps us from reacting poorly to the challenges that we're gonna face. And we're gonna face a lot of challenges. Sometimes I would tell my doctor that I feel, she would joke sometimes that you always think you're getting better. And I say, well, I, I kind of am getting better and that I'm learning how to deal with this. So it doesn't feel as bad as it did in the beginning. It's still rotten, but I'm feeling better because I understand better. Well, Linda and I like to keep things simple. And the accessorizing process we're gonna share with you today is rather straightforward. It's easy to remember. When you're confronted with a bad situation, an unexpected turn, negative feelings, difficult decisions, you want to pause. Pause. Then assess your situation and choose your action. This is a setup for disaster. I am clumsy at best, and I am concerned I'm going to fall off this chair. But anyway, the first step in our accessorizing process is to pause. When you get a diagnosis like lupus or scleroderma, or then you have a major setback, such as pulmonary artery hypertension, or you learn you're going to have to have a lung transplant, or some medicine that had given you great hope now doesn't work. It's like a bomb goes off in your living room. And it doesn't just affect you. It affects all of your loved ones. And it's very hard when you're in that kind of emotional chaos to just kind of pause and reflect, get some perspective, gather some strength before you rush out and make a decision that might or might not be in your best interest. I'll share with you a few ways that I've learned the importance of the pause. HALT is an acronym that is used by Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's to remind their members that any time they're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, to HALT. Don't rush into a decision that might not be in their best interest, because if you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, it's like standing on one leg. You're a bit off balance, and it's easy for anything to come along and knock you completely off balance. Another way to think about the importance of the pause was by an English author who said, when a road ends abruptly, take small steps. Otherwise, you just may find yourself off a cliff. My favorite of all is by the poet Ovid, who said, Take rest. A field that is rested yields a beautiful crop. There is, however, a bit of a caution. Sometimes when... Uh, you're in this situation and it's emotional chaos and you don't know what to do, you might want to linger in a little bit of self-pity. I think that's normal. I will tell you it's okay to visit self-pity, but don't live there. When you stay too long in self-pity, 
you run the risk of what's known as learned helplessness. You begin to see yourself as a victim and as everything that happens to you is outside your control, that you have no choices. When you're in that powerless state, it limits your options and it can destroy your self-esteem. The Scottish philosopher Dr. Megan Reek said, there are few human emotions as warm, as comforting, and as enveloping as self-pity. But nothing is more corrosive and destructive. There's only one answer. Step away from it and move on. So the next step in our process, pause, assess, choose, is assess. Assess is happening even when you're in that pause and reflecting mode. It's all about becoming more aware of your current reality. To be able to ask yourself, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What are my attitudes and beliefs and behaviors? And have they in any way contributed to my present state? Now, that's a bad question for me because oftentimes when I'm in a flare with lupus, I can ask myself that and say, you did it again. You pushed a little bit too hard. But to be able to be objective and look at what's going on and assess. To assess your resources. Do I have the resources I need to move forward? And to assess whether or not you have the strength to move forward or you may need to rest a bit longer so you can gather strength. And then the final step is to be able to choose the response or the reaction that it's in your best interest. And as Karen said, it's a lot easier to choose when you're in a crisis situation. If you've taken the time beforehand to decide how you want to live your life, if you've taken the time to define some values and some guiding principles. Epictetus, who lived long before Christ, said, Sickness is a hindrance to the body, but not to one's ability to choose, unless that's your choice. Lameness is a hindrance to the leg, but not to one's ability to choose. And if you say this with everything that happens to you, you will see obstacles as hindrances to something else, but not to yourself. So, how I've used the accessorizing process over the years. I've used it in small ways on a daily basis. Let's say, for example, somebody ticks you off. They make you so mad. And you just want to slap that person. It's a good idea to pause. <laughs> Count to three, walk away, whatever, and then decide, hmm, probably not a good idea to slap my boss. So then you choose the reaction that is best for you. But the main way I used the accessorizing process over the years was to be able to keep working. Early on in my disease, I was having so much difficulty that it was hard to work. And my doctor kept saying, Linda, you need to stop work. You need to quit and apply for disability. Now, he doesn't do that often. But the lupus was not responding. 
every drug they threw at me just simply did not work. And he said, you really need to consider quitting unless getting this lupus under control. But I was stubborn. I loved my job. It was my only source of income. And it was a great social support. So I kept trying. Just put one foot in front of the other. Just keep trying. And finally, I got so sick. It was after a lunch with Karen, and we were out looking for her new house. I got so sick when I went home, I couldn't even get out of the bed to make a bowl of soup for myself. So I paused. I did not quit my job at that time, but I agreed to take an indefinite leave of absence. I went to Alabama to live with my sister. And I didn't know at that time that I would ever be able to return to work and to my home in Greenville. But while I was with my sister, I rested, I reflected, I looked at my options and my resources. And after about five weeks, the lupus was still there. I was still sick, but I was better. And I realized that I could return to my home and return to work in a different way. I had to go back and negotiate a different way to do my job. Karen and I have realized over the years that chronic illness is ugly. We fully acknowledge that. This is not a Pollyanna message. You, chronic illness affects your relationships. It affects your finances. It affects your functional abilities. It affects how you look at yourself and how others look at you. It is ugly. But what we have to say is that your lives don't have to be ugly. Karen is going to share with you five, we're, we'll tag team, but we're going to go over five of the strategies that we use, not just to manage our illnesses, but to better manage our lives. So before we start, I, we just want to share a little uh, disclaimer. We want to acknowledge that lupus and scleroderma are not one-size-fits-all diseases, and there are no one-size-fits-all solutions. Um, everybody in this room is different, and your illnesses are different. Even though we all have scleroderma, how it's presenting is a little different. You have different resources. You have different needs. You have different experiences. So what, what works for one person isn't going to work for another. Can you hear me now? Sorry. So... Chronic illness is a very personal journey. And what works for us might not work for you. And frankly, we're still learning. So I'm hoping for a good 25 more years. And I bet I have got a lot to learn over the next 25 years. You have to negotiate these challenges. And you're probably going to have to be very flexible because what works today might not work tomorrow even for you. Linda and I choose different strategies or focus on different strategies because we're different people. You will have different strategies that work this year, but maybe not next year. What worked for me at 30 isn't working so much at 50. But we think you're going to find some of these strategies useful and relevant. Now, the first strategy we're going to talk about is setting healthy boundaries. And I always love to talk about this, and Linda probably likes me to talk about these because I don't do a very good job at this. I'm always struggling with this part. Constantly, I am constantly struggling with setting healthy boundaries. It's such a work in process. So setting healthy boundaries is, can be really difficult for a variety of reasons. Some of us are good at setting healthy boundaries in some parts of our lives, but not others. But all of us have probably can think of a time when we didn't do a very good job, especially in our transition phases, various transition periods of our disease. We don't aren't always good at setting healthy boundaries for, for a variety of reasons. We might not really know how to do that. We may not, may not have grown up with good role models. And maybe our role models didn't have to deal with chronic illness, so you didn't really get to see how to negotiate that. 
I was, had good fortune of having a wonderful aunt who had a, a, a tragedy in her, early in her life, and she showed me how to negotiate uh, and I didn't even know it, you know, for the first 30 years of my life, she was teaching me how to do that. So when my situation arose, I was a little better prepared. <clears throat> Some of the reasons we might have a difficult time, though, is we also might be in a little denial. Who's, who's been in a little denial with the disease? Act like you're pre-scleroderma, and you realize, I am not pre-scleroderma, I am post-scleroderma. I've got to think differently about what, what I'm gonna, how I'm going to spend my energy. We also might be attached to our old identities. I know in the first year that I had scleroderma, I, I used to play a lot of volleyball for about 10 years, and sometimes I played volleyball three days a week. I did not want to give that up in the beginning, and that first year, I kept trying to play. So you imagine how stupid I was letting a leather volleyball slam into my fingertips when I had scleroderma? Well, it, you know, eventually I learned my lesson, and I realized I had to give that up and I had to find new things to help define my identity, things that I love. But it was hard to give up some of those things about my life that I cared about, that I had to, to let go of. But while we might have a hard time setting healthy boundaries all the time, we definitely recognize how we, you know, when somebody's overstepped our boundaries, we feel anger, resentment, frustration. We might not even be sure what we're angry about or who we're angry at, because we might be, need to be angry at ourselves for letting it happen. But having healthy boundaries means that you are recognizing, acknowledging your limits. And everybody has limits, whether you have a chronic Ill illness or not. We're just going to have to adjust our perspective on what our limits are. And healthy boundaries are a sign of self-respect. If you don't become good at setting healthy boundaries. You're going to let your energy be pooled all over the place. And when you have chronic illness, you just don't have that kind of energy to spare. So you have to really prioritize and constantly do that because your priorities are going to change and your situation and your boundaries are going to have to change. You also have to think about your consequences, the consequences of your choices. Now, I'm still working, and I hope I get to work 10 more years. That would be my goal, 10 more years. But that might not be realistic. So we take it you know, year at a time. But early on in my career, I was having a conversation with one of my bosses, and he was telling me, you know, young faculty need to make sacrifices to be successful in their careers. And it occurred to me when I was talking to him that he had a very abstract idea of what sacrifice is. But I had a very concrete idea of what sacrifice was. So I held up one of my ulcerated fingers and I said, when you say I need to make a sacrifice, how much of my finger are you talking about? How much of my finger is this project worth? Because that was my reality, and that was something I had to come to terms with, that when I pushed in those limits, I was going to pay pretty early, and I was going to be very visible. And everybody pays for their sacrifices. Sometimes they just don't see it till later. But when you have chronic illness, you see it pretty quickly and early on. Learning how to pause before you take on new commitments and responsibilities is going to be very important in using the healthy boundary strategy. Give yourself that 15 minutes. Give yourself that day. Really think about the consequences. And I'm speaking from experience. Um, it's a constant battle because I still want, I don't want to miss out on anything. I still want to do these things. But I have a great friend over my shoulder here who keeps saying, come and talk to me before you say yes to anything. It doesn't always work. But she keeps trying. <laughs> I love her for that. So an important thing to consider here is that the problem with setting healthy boundaries isn't that people ask you to do things. It's that you say yes when it's really not in your best interest to do so. Now, the second strategy I'm going to share with you is be learning your signs and symptoms, learning your warning signs. This is going to be an important skill. All of you probably know when you've pushed yourself a little too far. Some of these signs you listen to, some you don't. Sometimes they change over time. You have to start to tune your ear to the new changes. Um, learning to recognize and act on those signs are going to be critical in your well-being. People with autoimmune diseases remind me of the canaries the miners used to take down in the mines to detect poisonous gases in the tunnels. We're the canaries. And today's toxic environment is kind of like the poisonous gas in the mine. 
we are more vulnerable to that toxic environment. So when the miners took the canaries down, the canary fell over, they knew we better get out of here. And I think that's kind of what we're like. We should be the canaries for everybody else because these toxic environments affect everybody. We just get affected sooner, but it's toxic for everybody. So as important as it is to learn your warning signs, it's equally important to act on those warning signs. Now Linda's husband, Will, often notices the early warning signs that Linda has pushed herself too far before she notices them or she's ready to concede to them. And none of us want anybody to tell us what to do or tell us what not to do. But it's very frustrating for our loved ones to see us ignoring our warning signs and pushing too hard because they do know the consequences of doing that, and that is suffering. We will suffer. They will suffer. So pay attention to your warning signs and get out of the mine. Get out of that toxic environment when you start to detect them. Don't wait until your body has to send you a stronger signal or maybe shut you down before you get out. Don't look too long at that. I don't want anybody throwing up their breakfast. <laughs> um, our third strategy is uh, reach for the yellow boys, and I refer to yellow boys as my support system. In the six months after I was diagnosed with lupus, my precious sister died at age 47. This was my first significant loss, and I spiraled into grief. Made the lupus worse. I often tell people grief is physical, and it, the lupus kept getting worse and worse. I finally had to be hospitalized because the lupus was out of control and put on IV steroids in the hospital. While I was in the hospital, my husband at the time, I had been married for 28 years, decided that he didn't want to be in the marriage anymore. He believed that if I just wanted to get better, I could. <laughs> that the lupus was all in my head. I looked okay. So he left me emotionally while I was in the hospital. I could tell it, even though he was kind and did the right things, said the right things. It was as if he had moved behind a steel wall and there was no way for me to get behind that wall. And then when I got home, he had moved into the guest bedroom and shortly thereafter, he asked for a divorce. My only son moved across country from South Carolina to Oregon and then I had to sell my house, which was my sanctuary, because it was simply too much for me to manage in that condition. So one night, I was all alone and I wrote in my journal that I feel as if I've been tossed into a raging sea. I can't swim. I want to get to the shore. I really don't want to die here, but I'm too weak. I may as well just give up. And then I imagined all of my family and friends who just when I needed them the most would send a card or a letter or they would come to visit and encourage me. And I imagined these family and friends as these bright yellow boys scattered about in the sea with me. And I realized I didn't have to make it all the way to the shore in my weakened state. All I had to do was look for and then reach for the nearest yellow buoy. And if I kept doing that, eventually I would be strong enough to get all the way to shore. Now I also realized that for me, yellow buoys are not 
always people or groups of people. I gathered strength during this time from inspirational readings, from being outside in nature, just sitting on a bench and observing the trees and the nature around me, by meditating, by prayer, any one or anything that could give me the strength for the moment so that I could carry on and move forward. So a lot of people have trouble acknowledging that they need help. Are any of you like that? <laughs> Not me, I'm tough. I don't need any help. Not me. Well, I grew up in the country in South Alabama. I'm sure you can't tell that by my accent. <laughs> and there's a country saying, if you want milk, don't park your stool in the middle of the field and wait for the cow to back up to it. <laughs> Sometimes you have to go look for the cow. So it is normal and healthy to ask for support when you need it. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead while he does this. Our fourth strategy is to grieve your losses. Now, most people think of grieving with, associate that with the death of a loved one. But grieving can occur with any significant loss. And all of you in here can relate when I say significant losses. You have lost a lot when you have a chronic illness. You may have lost a spouse or a partner, as I did. Maybe you've had to stop work, so you've lost your income. You've lost a lot of financial resources. Friends thin out. They just tend to disappear at times because you can't always do with them what you once did. And the loss of your self-esteem and your self-image. Those are huge losses, and they need to be grieved and processed. Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross did a lot of research with terminally ill patients. And she found that these patients, when they were going through the grieving process, they tended to go through different stages in their grieving. The first was denial. Not me. I don't have lupus. Somebody has made a big mistake. And then bargaining. Please, 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 please don't let me have this. If you will just make me better, I promise you I'll eat beans. I won't eat as much ice cream. I'll exercise. Please just let this go away. And then anger. How can this happen to me? I did all the right things, and yet I've gotten this crappy disease. That's just not fair. And often, depression. You've just, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with this illness? Until finally some people are able to reach acceptance. Dr. Kubler-Ross never intended these neat little classifications to be a step one, you process through that, and then you move on neatly to the next one. It doesn't work that way. When you're going through a significant loss, it's more like a cauldron of emotions. Or I don't know if any of you have ever seen that um, children's game where they have a hammer and something pops up over here and they knock it down, it pops up over here and they knock it down. That's kind of the way it is with the emotions of chronic illness. 
just when you think you've worked your way through one, it resurfaces. So even after 17 years or so of living with lupus, I'm sometimes still in denial, and I'm often sometimes angry about the restrictions imposed by lupus. One day in this angry state of denial, I was with a friend who also has lupus, and we have the same doctor. So I said to her, maybe we don't even have lupus. I think our doctor hates women. Have you seen the office? Have you seen that waiting room? All women. Now, what if, what if we just stop taking all this nasty medicine? We might be perfectly well and not even know it. Well, it doesn't work that way, but I was very angry and was in denial at the time. The way that Dr. David Rico says is a good way to process all of these strong emotions is what he calls the triple A practice. Admit what you're feeling. That's all about becoming more self-aware. I'm angry. I'm sad. Label your feelings. And then allow those feelings. Don't try to deny them or shut them down. Lean into them a little bit. Feel how it makes your body feel when you're going through the anger or the other strong emotions. But then act in such a way that you can move forward. Do something positive. Write in your journal. Express yourself in some way. Shakespeare said, give sorrow words. The grief that does not speak whispers the o'erfraught heart and bids it break. When I was going through all of this time, I wanted to cry. I wanted to get the tears and the hurt and the pain out, but I couldn't cry. So one night, I felt that I had to express these feelings in some way. I wanted to scream. But I lived in a neighborhood with concerned neighbors. And I thought, mm, if I scream, they're going to call the police. Or worse yet, they're going to commit me to a psychiatric hospital. So I turned on the water in my kitchen sink. I turned on the garbage disposal. I put my head over the sink, and I screamed, and I screamed, and I screamed. The police didn't come. And I felt a lot better. So it is good to recognize what you're feeling and to try to get those feelings out in a constructive way. Another physician, Dr. Sir William Osler, said, if hurt doesn't find an outlet in tears, it may cause other organs to weep. And our fifth and final strategy is to use your strengths to find renewed purpose and meaning in your life. We tend to identify ourselves with what we do. I'm a nurse. I'm a doctor. I'm a teacher. Or... Our identity is also influenced by what we earn, the status symbols that we have acquired, the accolades that we get from doing our jobs. But then an accident or chronic illness comes along, you're no longer able to do what you once did. 
Maybe you were the breadwinner for your household and you've had to quit your job. Or you were the consummate homemaker, but now you can't even vacuum the living room without getting short of breath. Some of you will say that's not really a loss. <laughs> but it, is, it does affect your self-esteem, your sense of purpose. You may feel, why am I getting up in the morning? I'm really of no value to anybody. You have lost your purpose, your why in life. But I will tell you that no matter if your roles and responsibilities have changed, even if your finances have changed, the way you look at yourself and the way others look at, your, at you, you are still you. There are certain core character strengths that make you uniquely who you are. Those strengths that are the right and best about you, that others know, and that you can use those strengths to build purpose and meaning in your life again. Dr. Marty Seligman, how many of you have heard of Dr. Seligman and his work on happiness and a flourishing life? He and others from the University of Pennsylvania have studied character strengths and how these character strengths help people to live a more satisfying life. He has studied character strengths in different cultures, with different religious groups, different nationalities, etc. And they've identified 24 character strengths that are universal, regardless of country, of origin, nationality, etc. And they've developed a scale called the VIA Character Strength Scale. And you can fill that out and find out what are your strongest character strengths? And the first five are known to be your signature strengths. And they found in their research that when people use their signature strengths, they are more satisfied with life, they tend to have better physical and mental health, they can build stronger social networks, and in general, they're much happier. I filled out that character strength scale, and what I learned was that even though I can't work full time, I can't earn a huge salary, I can't vacuum the living room, I am still me, and I can use my core strengths to do other things. For example, two of my signature strengths are creativity and perseverance. I use those strengths in working with Karen to write a book. Only took me 16 years. <laughs> so, Mother Teresa says, not everyone can do great things, but all of us can do small things with great love. So maybe one of your signature strengths is leadership. You're no longer able to run a company or a function or a group of employees but maybe you can lead a Sunday school class or your neighborhood association or a support group. Maybe your signature strength is not leadership but teamwork. So you can't lead, but you can certainly help in other ways. And maybe your signature strength is kindness, loving kindness and generosity or wisdom. And the world needs a great deal of that. 
How many of you have heard of Inspire.com? It's an online platform for patient engagement and support. So even those who cannot leave their home can still use their strengths to inspire, encourage others. I have been amazed at the people on Inspire.com, those who seem to be suffering the most, carrying a tremendous load, take the time out of their day to encourage someone else and to give of their intelligence and their wisdom. The people on there are pretty well educated about their diseases and they are there to share with others. So I would challenge you to figure out what your strengths are if you don't already know them and use them so that you can create a new why in your life. Nietzsche said, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. Well, all of us have challenges to face with our ugly dresses, and they must be acknowledged and assessed and acted on in some way. We can learn to balance out the negative and the positive in our lives to have a beautiful life. But balance doesn't mean standing still. Balance really involves constant movement, adjustment, and flexibility. While it would be nice to be able to paddle on a calm, placid lake for our lives, it is not realistic. And life with a chronic illness is more like paddling on the river. There are calm spots, there are bumpy spots, and there are terrifying spots. So we have to learn to balance. No one asks for chronic illness, we don't want it, but it is our current reality, so we have to decide not to stay stuck in resentment or anger, acknowledge what we have to deal with, address this in, a, as, a positive, in as a positive way as possible, and move forward. So chronic illness is ugly, but your life doesn't have to be. The next time that you're faced with a difficult decision or challenge, remember to pause. Then assess and choose the thoughts or actions that are in your best interest to move you in the direction you want to go with your life. Listen to your body, grieve your losses, redefine your boundaries, get support, and most importantly, use your strengths to find renewed purpose in life. Linda and I really appreciate you having uh, brought us here today and sharing some time with us. We hope you have a wonderful day, learning new things, meeting old and new friends, and enjoying this time together. Thank you so much for having us, and we hope to see you again soon.